Hello there, ladies and gents. Robert Sykes, KetoSavage.com. And today, I have a special guest, Trevor White, in the flesh. And we're going to be talking, this is the second time you've been on the podcast, right? Third. Third? Third time. Third time on the podcast. Yeah. We are doing a video and an audio format, so if you're listening to this, feel free to watch on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, feel free to listen to it on your preferred podcast device. And we are going to be diving into... All things competition prep. Trevor just went through a competition prep. We're at the farm right now, my family farm. We just spent the past several days enjoying nature. So we'll probably talk about that. And it's going to be good. So sit back, relax. It's unfortunate you don't have the scenery like we do behind us, but it is what it is. We're going to drink our coffee, have a conversation, get ready. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, man. Let me um, grab my coffee here. <clears throat> can't complain. The farm has been amazing. I feel like I've gotten a complete reset. Yeah, we've both been sleeping in until like 6, and you were waking up at like 1, so this is a pretty big difference. Yeah, since the cut, I feel like um, at the end of that cut, kind of my hormones got jacked up. I was waking up really, really early, like 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, and just ready to start my day. Just like yeah. on fire, ready to go, so getting up at 1, like going to bed around 7, between 7 and 8 p.m. and waking up at 1. Well, the nice thing about here is there's no internet, so, like, there's nothing to do if there's no sun out. So, like, when the sun goes down, you go down. You when go the down. sun comes up, you come up. Yeah. Yeah, which has been really nice. So, most people, if you've been on the podcast three times, they've probably heard one of your prior episodes. But if anybody hasn't, can you give them a little quick bio intro on you? Yeah, so, um, Trevor White, I am... Um, I have my master's degree in exercise and nutrition physiology from the University of Tampa. Um, I have been studying the ketogenic diet for, and following a ketogenic diet for about 10 years now, um, since college. Um, I got introduced to it because I was involved in a study my sophomore year, um, that I was a part of that, um, Ryan Lowry and Jacob Wilson and Dr. Dom Dominic D'Agostino was a part of back in the day, so, um, I never looked back after that. I saw the benefits of a ketogenic lifestyle as I started to live, kind of live it. Um, I gained muscle, I lost body fat, uh, and I never turned back. So, You and I have known each other. We met at the first KetoCon, which I think was in 2017. Mm -hmm. And we hit it off immediately because we both were speaking the whole long game mindset. We were, speak we were big into like just being strict keto, and allowing your body to have the time to truly optimize for that as opposed to introducing all these, you know, all these excess and alternative and <laughs> distractive variables. And I feel like, you know, you've been dabbling with keto for the past 10 years. You've been strict keto for the past five or six years, Correct. same as myself. And I yeah. feel like in doing that, we've learned a lot about what's possible yeah. with a true keto adaptation. And I feel like both you and I can attest to the fact that the length of that adaptation matters, and it just keeps compounding and having and having a beneficial effect over time. Like it doesn't, you don't just stay stagnant with it. Yeah, yeah, I, I 100 percent agree with that testament. The, I remember when I first went um, keto, and then I was dabbling in it. I played around with targeted ketogenic approaches, cyclical ketogenic approaches, but I always seemed to keep on a lot of body fat as well. Um, and I felt like I was just in this limbo stage and I was never able to optimize because I was always playing around with carbohydrate. Um, maybe I wasn't able to optimize the amount of carbohydrate coming in uh, and that ultimately led to more body fat, worse performance. Um, but as I uh, found my way to a strict ketogenic diet, and I've been to the point where I was, you know, I've been 90% where your brain feels absolutely on fire and then coming down to like around 60%. Um, I've played around with a lot, but when I found the strict ketogenic approach, that's where I found my, my niche and my sweet spot where I'm able to control blood glucose. I'm able to control my hunger hormones. Um, my performance in the gym has never been better. Um, I feel, um, I was always able to maintain strength, maintain performance, um, anaerobic performance, aerobic performance, all the above. And I feel like a lot of people... They, they get into doing a ketogenic diet for the purpose of weight loss. That's kind of like the primary driver. Mm -hmm. And then 
that's pretty much the bulk of the demographic that plays around with keto. I feel like there is a definite growing subset that are getting into it for performance, but that subset is still under the belief that you have to have strategically placed carbohydrates to optimize for performance. Yeah. And it's interesting because both you and I have, you know, countered that and, and gone the other direction, and both you and I do extreme performance sports. Mm -hmm. So you came to me and wanted to do a prep, and I took you through a six month prep. I want to dive into that for sure. Yeah. So let's just start with let's just start with some of the stats, man. So like, what were you at like body weight wise? Rough estimate on your body composition. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of throw some of those pictures in here for those that are watching the video. Yeah, absolutely. So starting out, I, um, I believe I was exactly like 187.4 pounds um, initially starting the cut. Um, I was on the in-body test. I got an in-body done prior to, to, um, to the cut. And on the in-body, it said I was 11% body fat. But n judging by what I was looking for, like and everything I think I was more around 14 to 15 percent mm -hmm. um, and then I was holding on to 20 pounds of fat mass that attributed in the in body that's what it said um, and then what other stats that you would want to know you have any idea what your calories and macros and stuff my were? calories were at um, for maintenance of 187 pounds I was at about 31 I was about 3,000 to 3,200 calories a day um, that's what I was maintaining right around 185 to 187 pounds at that time. Um, my macros then were right around like a one-to-one. -one, um, I was probably like 185 pound, uh, grams of protein with like 220, 230-ish fat and probably around sub-20 uh, 20 grams of carbs. And when I started you out... Six months ago, I started you at basically 80% of your calories coming from fat. And we started at how many calories? Like right around 3,000, right? Right around 3,000. I think it w we started, yeah, it was 3,000 or 29. Yeah, right, right there around the three mark. And then we went through the protocol. You got down to, you had a photo shoot. Like we, we were kind of cutting at the same time. I had started a little bit before you. I would started in November. When did you start yours? Six months from well, seven months from now. Which yeah, so basically right at the beginning of the year, roughly. Yeah, right at the beginning of the year, January. Um, and the, you were wanting to compete as well, but all my shows got canceled due to the virus. Yeah. All your potential shows got canceled due to the virus. So yeah. you basically turned yours in. I mean, your primary focus was the modeling. So yeah. you wanted to do a photo shoot. So you did three or four full-blown photo shoots. Yeah. Um, and we peaked you for that last photo shoot in the gym. We'll throw a, a clip of that picture yeah. in now yeah. but you got freaking shredded man the most shredded i've ever been in my life um i i was telling you earlier i, I felt like grainy and i've yeah. never been to that point before i've been pretty lean um where i've done my own cuts and, and stuff but i've never been to the extent that i've been at you know doing a prep with you and um actually prepping for the uh the photo shoots and stuff it was crazy because you and and your body responded perfectly like Every manipulation we made, we, we it was able to elicit the exact response we were looking for. It was sustainable. I mean, you didn't really have any kind of crazy hunger pains until that last week, really. Yeah. But then yeah. at that point, we started introducing the refeeds, so that made it, the lower calories more sustainable as well. Yeah. Everything just, it was like textbook. Yeah, you know? it was perfect. I think that had I not been fat adapted for so long, um, I think I would have probably struggled a little bit more as calories got lower and I got that lean because mm -hmm. I've never been that lean. I've been pretty lean, but I've never been, I, I was probably su like sub 4%. I was like three, 4%. Body yeah. Fat. I think you were easily between three and a half and four and a half, somewhere in that yeah. window for sure. Yeah. And that's low. I mean, I, I, by the end of it, like I felt really great until the very last week. Um, which I didn't feel bad. I just like I could feel the effects of being that low in uh, body composition. But um, like I was saying, I think that me being fat adapted for five, six years in advance helped a lot with that. And I, that's where I uh, we kind of like agree with the deeper you are fat adapted and the, the longer you can stay fat adapted without a carbohydrate refeed or, you know, becoming 
you know, metabolically flexible in the way of introducing a ton of carbs, um, I think it, it will actually benefit you in the long run. Yeah, I totally agree. And and it's funny because we can get into a whole diatribe about, you know, metabolic flexibility and some of the controversial dieting philosophies out there now mm-hmm. if you want. But it's not like one way is better than another. It all just depends on what the individual finds sustainable, what the individual is trying to optimize for. Yeah. But there's like a sliding scale. Like if you want to be able to incorporate carbohydrates, then you can structure your nutrition and your cycling of those carbohydrates and make that work for you. Yeah. If you want to optimize for keto and truly make that your lifestyle that you, you know, quote unquote perfect and really, really, really optimize for, then you're going to be better off eating a ketogenic lifestyle 100% of the time. You don't have to eat a ketogenic lifestyle 100% of the time, but if you do, you're going to be better off from an optimization standpoint leveraging keto. Yeah, exactly. I think there's definitely a difference between optimizing and then kind of um, playing in the limbo stage where you're you're trying to you're trying to feed your body two different fuel sources and it never optimizes for one over the other. It just it you know, you're metabolically flexible, sure, but you're not optim you're not optimizing one way or the other. Yeah, I was actually talking to uh Dave Feldman about this at a low carb cruise way back in the day. And he, he had a good analogy for it. He basically compared it to like like a imagine you're racing. You've got like a stock car racing where you want to keep everything just stock basically. Yeah. Um and I don't know much about stock car racing, so I may <laughs> stick my foot in my mouth here. But like <laughs> you basically either, you know, optimize for one specific thing and you just become the world's greatest at that one thing, mm-hmm. or you try and, you know, have like a multi-purpose vehicle that does a little bit of everything. It's you like know, a utility vehicle. Yeah, like a utility vehicle. Mm-hmm. And not that one is right and one is wrong, right. but you it does it makes no sense to expect being the absolute greatest at one thing if you don't have a disciplined approach to that one thing. Like that just doesn't make any intuitive sense whatsoever. Yeah, I 100% agree with that testament. I mean, that is a great analogy. I never didn't think about it that way, but that makes so much sense to me because if you look at athletes, Olympic athletes, a swimmer like Michael Phelps, for him to optimize his swimming gait or you know his breaststroke or something, he's not going to go and do something completely different that would have no transfer over effect. So in, in terms of lifestyle and dieting and nutrition it it makes no sense to me that you would want to do a ketogenic prep optimize for fat adaptation for five six months and then do a introduce carbohydrates i mean i don't your body is going to have elicit some responses that are i don't feel like are going to be optimal for for yeah you know um so that all being said, you know, me going through and by the end of it and incorporating the refeeds, my body soaked in the nutrients that it needed and I felt amazing. Like with those refeeds, it was perfect. Yeah. I think well, let's just define we were talking the other day as we were walking. Let's let's define what a ketogenic, you know, like if whatever your sport is, whether it's bodybuilding, you know, ultra marathon running, whatever that may be, Let's define what a ketogenic athlete in that realm is. Like, how would you describe that? I think for me, a ketogenic <clears throat> athlete is someone that is um, fully fat adapted and utilizing fatty acids and stored body fat as fuel um, as an athlete in that realm um, and producing ketones. Yeah, I think, you know, you can you can eat a certain degree of carbohydrate. Everybody's going to have a different carbohydrate threshold, and they're still going to have ketones in their blood Correct. if that carbohydrate you know, amount is not just blown out of proportion. Uh, so like somebody could eat you know, 100 grams of carbohydrates, and if they're a you know, heavily muscled, well-trained, well-adapted individual, they'll still be producing ketones and test positive for beta-hydroxybutyrate if they do a blood test. But if they're introducing those 100 grams of carbohydrates pre or post training or as a carb up to elicit a certain response yeah. i would argue that that is not a like if that's in the realm of bodybuilding for instance if they're using those 100 grams of carbohydrates to to fill out pre stage that's not them being a ketogenic bodybuilder so much as it is them being a low carb athlete because they're not using 
fat and ketones as the primary driver for optimizing them filling out for stepping on stage. Yeah, I, I agree with that. They're more more or less leveraging the carbohydrate coming in to maximally uh, for their maximal performance. Yeah. Um, whereas with us, we leveraged fat. We we leveraged a fat refeed um, and even a protein bump to help fill out and 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 sodium like electrolytes you know yep Yep. and that to me is the difference between a ketogenic athlete and a low carb or you know uh, athlete in general yeah i think i got a rabbit hole in this too but a lot of people now are trying to you know have their cake and eat it too so to speak and they'll have a large bolus of carbohydrates. Then the next day they'll test their ketones and they'll be at 0.5. And they'll just assume that since they are registering ketones that, oh, I'm metabolically flexible all as well. This this is okay for me. The problem is, I, I, I think I spoke about this on a live I did with Crystal a few weeks back. But her father came in and spent three weeks with us kind of doing like a keto boot camp and getting adapted. Prior to that three-week mark, he had never eaten a ketogenic diet. He's... 50 something years old has been living his whole life eating carbohydrates and processed food after a couple days he was showing ketones in his blood that does not mean he's keto adapted that means he's producing ketones Um, after a couple more days he was you know you could verify him as being in ketosis but again that doesn't mean he's fat adapted keto adapted so that's what's happening with a lot of these people that are eating a large bowl of carbohydrates and considering themselves metabolically flexible they'll eat a big meal of carbs the next day, measure some ketones and just assume that all is well. Right. Which couldn't be farther from the truth. No. There's a big difference between fat adapted, keto adapted, and, you know, producing ketones. I mean, you can produce ketones by one, either taking exogenous ketones, you know, which a lot of people think that they should do when they eat a big bolus of carbohydrate, then take exogenous ketones, register ketones, and they're still, they still feel or think that they're a ketogenic athlete or they're in ketosis. Um, but I would argue that being in a deep, deeper state of ketosis and being completely fat adapted and being able to leverage that is far different than actually just producing ketones because, I mean, we could go out for a run right now. We're pretty fasted right now. And if we weren't, even if we weren't fat adapted and we ran on carbohydrate as fuel, we could in theory come back and, um, register ketones on a ketone meter. 0.5 0.5 to you know one millimole um, because our body is going to produce those based on the oxidative stress from training you know um, but there's definitely a difference between fat adaptation and fully keto adapted for years um, and you know producing ketones for a day yeah what what is it because I've been preaching this from the rooftop since day one you know like allowing your body to truly reach that deeper state of ketosis, I feel like a lot of people find that, you know, staying, quote-unquote, strict keto is not sustainable. And I feel like there's there's a definite difference between being strict keto and strict carnivore. And there's become so, there's so many new subsets for the ketogenic diet because it's been around long enough now, it's had enough hype surrounding it, that everybody's come out with their own version of it. And this idea of what strict keto entails has become this limiting idea. And I feel like we need to kind of shed some clarity on that, shed some light on that, because you can be strict keto and be eating all kinds of vegetables. You can be strict keto to eat all kinds of meat. You can have all kinds of dairy. Like, it doesn't have to be a limiting diet in the slightest. So, I mean, you and I both have been strict keto for five, six years now. Yet we get to enjoy chaffles we get to enjoy all these things that people look at in the ketogenic diet and be like oh that looks amazing and then i could totally eat that that's all within the realms of being strict keto yeah for me uh, there's not a thing that i don't miss um, i mean like we I, I don't eat grains obviously and carbohydrate but i still eat pizza i still eat pancakes i still eat waffles in the form of a chaffle um, i can still make cookies um, and I make all these things without all of the sweeteners and all the things that you know you're trying to replace to give it that sweetness. Um, like a little closer. So, for for me, it's 
it's living a, it's being able to live like a flexible ketogenic lifestyle in the form of still taking in you know sub 20 grams of carbs 15 10 grams of carbs but being able to eat all your favorite foods um, so for a pizza I'll make a mitza. I'll use a, a mitza crust with like a, a lean ground bison topped with, you know, mozzarella cheese, Parmesan cheese, um, pepperoni, bacon, whatever you want to throw on there. It doesn't matter as long as it's ketogenic. But there's just the only thing it's missing is grains. Um, if I wanted a crust on there, I would just make a mitza and then throw it on top of a chaffle, which the chaffle is just made out of egg and cheese. But it tastes like bread. Um so if, as far as like people feeling that they miss things in a ketogenic diet, I think it's their lack of creativity. Um, and I think a lot of people lack discipline and they, they lack the ability to just stay on something for a long time and they feel they need ever changing like ever like they they constantly need to change things up or shake things up and i feel like that attributes to them not being able to stay disciplined and and continue on down the journey that they've started yeah i mean i look at you know my progression of going through all the different dieting protocols over the years before keto and like flexible dieting was something that i was introduced to in the natural bodybuilding space um, and flexible dieting is basically the if it fits your macros concept of finding foods that allow you to hit your macronutrient goals based off of whatever your compositional goal is at the time, whether you're in a building phase, a cutting phase, whatever that may look like. And as long as you're hitting those macros, you're safe. Now, the problem with that is the, the well-intentioned flexible dieter gets misconstrued because they start incorporating heavily processed sugary foods because they still technically hit those macros but that's not really optimal obviously like a pop tart shouldn't be justifiable um, but when you take the concept of flexible dieting which is basically having the flexibility to incorporate different foods within a certain macronutrient realm and you apply that to a ketogenic diet in which you ideally are focusing on macronutrient quality, micronutrient quality, the sourcing of those foods. That's like the sweet spot. You know, that's what you do. That's what I do. That's pretty much just a strict ketogenic diet with defined macronutrient goals because you have a specific goal in mind to reach. Mm -hmm. And you find foods that you enjoy that are nutrient dense to fill those macros. And you have the variety to make it sustainable. Yep. hundred percent. Um, being able to choose the foundation of the diet should be focused around bioavailable micronutrient dense foods you know red meats you know we, we eat a lot of ribeyes um not to make it about the keto brick but the keto brick is fantastic product to kind of it's the perfect macronutrients for a ketogenic diet but also has a ton of micros in there via the flax and uh you know you got the proteins in there and you got your um, satiating fats you got everything in there that you would need um, and then building the diet around like a 90, 90 to 95% of the diet coming from good whole sources of foods, eggs, red meat, fish, um, and then being able to be a little bit flexible and, and quote unquote flexible in my terms is having a chaffle or having keto pancakes like low carb pancakes, um, being able to, to make a fathead pizza or a cauliflower crust pizza or a pizza that's flexible that you know but the f still the foundation it, when you make those foods is still built around um, good quality sources of foods that you're choosing um, I always choose grass-fed and and as much as I can um, organic um, but if you're even if your budget doesn't a lot for that you still choosing like clean sources, cleaner sources of ketogenic foods, I think is better than choosing processed Pop-Tarts and cookies and, you know, re like all of those things. So I, I think ultimately um, when you're actually cho choosing whole foods and getting bioavailable micronutrient dense foods into the diet and making that the base of the diet, that's when you start to optimize your body and you can see big differences because when you're eating the processed junk even if it's keto processed junk you're holding on to a ton of water 
uh, and a ton of inflammation from those those process things. Yeah, I feel like you know, it's it makes sense to have periods in your life where you you have a little bit more flexibility. You eat all within the realm of ketogenic, you know, foods and quality foods. But like I used the example the other day of you know, on my wedding, we had cheesecake, but it was keto cheesecake. Like Crystal made it, had all ketogenic foods. Those aren't the optimal foods. Like my body is going to benefit more from grass-fed beef than it would a keto cheesecake. But that's a special occasion. It warrants having something a little bit outside the norm. I don't feel guilty for having that because it's still ketogenic. It's still, it's not resulting in a backpedaling of how my body feels and performs. Now, if I was to have a normal cheesecake, I would feel poor the next day. I would feel probably poor after eating it I would feel like I'm holding more water I've got more inflammation I wouldn't feel optimal and that's a period in my life where I want to feel optimal I want to be able to soak up every moment in memory like on my wedding day so I feel like if you apply those same principles to your own life whatever your special occasions are if you're able to have a food that is fun and entertaining like your kids would enjoy but is still within the context and within the realm of what you stand for nutritionally speaking and you know in your heart of hearts that it's not having a, dis- a disadvantage or an adverse effect on you overall, then you don't have that guilt associated with eating it. And then you're able to just bounce back the next day and pick things right up where you left off, and you're not any worse off for it, you know? I think that's huge. Um, kind of what you just said right there is is it takes me – it makes me think about what people are kind of saying nowadays where they're saying they're that they feel that they're missing out if they – you know, are going to a party or if they want to have pancakes with their kids. But in my opinion, if if your foundation and your lifestyle is built around a ketogenic diet and, you know, that's the way you want to live and that's the way you want to raise your, your kids or your family in general, um, I don't think that you should have to feel that you need to introduce carbohydrates because your kids want pancakes one morning I feel like you can do that in a ketogenic way you just have the ketogenic pancakes like you have low carb pancakes Um, but the thought that you're missing out because you can't have a beer with somebody or you're missing out because you can't go out and have a pizza with someone I don't really agree with that because I don't feel like I'm missing out in anything living a fully ketogenic lifestyle for the last six years um Maybe it's crazy to think that way. I'm not sure. I just don't feel that I miss out on things. I feel that I'm optimizing my body. Um, and I, I don't know. I, it's weird. It's it's like puts people in this limbo stage. I feel like that's where this whole metabolic flexibility thing kind of came up, where it was people that they, they just feel that they're missing out on life. But I'll tell you what, I've been keto, strict ketogenic for six years and I eat pancakes waffles everything all the above and I don't feel like I miss out on anything um, without incorporating carbohydrate yeah I um, again this is not designed to be a podcast against metabolic flexibility I think at the core we both agree with metabolic flexibility absolutely Um, and we can dive into that but I do get tired of hearing people say and this is going to be a controversial topic so I'm probably going to lose some followers here but I get tired of hearing people say that their relationship with their their children, their spouse, their loved ones, their friends is diminished or suffers because they don't indulge in a certain type of food with them. Like if you if your relationship with your kids is going to be, you know, put at a disadvantage because you don't wake up in the morning and have cereal with them or waffles with them or syrup with them, donuts with them, then First of all, why would you want your kids to be eating foods that you know are not really good foods? Secondly, then your relationship's what needs work, not the food on your plate. Like, if your relationship is so dependent on what you consume that it can hinder your relationship, then it's probably not the best of relationships. Like, you need to work on that first and foremost. Um, I mean, yeah, there's there's a little bit of friction sometimes. Like, when I go to my family's Thanksgiving and, and my Aunt Alice makes these amazing rolls that are like put on a pedestal, I don't eat the rolls, but I can promise you that I still love my Aunt Alice and she still loves me and it's going to be okay. 
um, you just have to have enough discipline and know what you stand for and not feel like, and not really even care. Like if people are going to judge you for the foods that you eat or don't eat, then you have to train them to think differently about that. Like if they're your family or if they're someone that actually cares about you as an individual, then they'll get over it pretty quick. You know, like you can't give in and have a moment of weakness just simply because people have a little bit of friction towards the food you're consuming because that's just uh, that's just a lack of priority right there. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, for me, it's um, I've just always been the type and and again, it, this isn't we both definitely agree with metabolic li- metabolic flexibility and that approach. Um, we should in probably a, define that. Like, why why do we agree with it? What what is it that we agree with? We feel that you know, um, with a higher carbohydrate, um, when you when you're coming from a state of inflexibility, metabolic inflexibility, where you're deranged, metabolically deranged, and you can't utilize fat as fuel because um, you're just utilizing carbohydrate then you go ketogenic and you become metabolically flexible, then being able to start like incorporating some amount of carbs b- makes you a little bit more flexible um, and it makes you more insulin sensitive when you go keto. Um, so that's becoming metabolically flexible. Now you still have the ability to utilize those carbohydrates if need be, um, but you're not constantly trying to feed the body carbohydrate. You're, you're, you're now... A ketogenic or low carb or you know you're running on fat as fuel or fatty acids as fuel but now you still have that ability the brain still has that ability and the body still has that ability to switch back and use carbohydrate now you're metabolically flexible um, it's I, for uh, for us it's not being a strict ketogenic athlete and then incorporating carb ups or incorporating carbs to for performance or something like that yeah I mean just to kind of reiterate what you just said, like when you you're coming from a place that is metabolically inflexible, you've been eating carbohydrates your whole life, and then you go keto, you become fat adapted, keto adapted, and you can tap into your stored adipose tissue for fuel and produce ketones. Boom, you're metabolically flexible. That's a good thing. I want everybody in the world to be metabolically flexible in that sense of the word. You don't need to go the other way and backtrack and reintroduce the carbs. It's not like your body forgets how to use carbohydrates. It's not like your body forgets how to use glucose. It's not like insulin forgets how to shuttle sugars into the cells for energy. Like that's something your body just biology is not going to change. It's not going to forget how to do that. There may be a brief period of you know like if I eat a massive cake right now, like a normal cake, then I'd probably feel more sluggish than if I had you know titrated that cake content up week after week after week. But at the end of the day, do I really want to eat cake in the first place? No. Your body's not going to forget how to use carbohydrates and glucose. So you're never going to become metabolically inflexible by being strict keto. Like Dom, I had Dom on the podcast a couple weeks ago, and he said he was strict keto for 10 years, and then he experimented with carbohydrates again, and everything worked fine. You know, it's not like your body forgets. So there's no need to just feel like you're digging yourself a hole by being strict keto. Yeah, Yeah, I agree with that. But, yeah, that's we have a whole podcast on that alone. We could, for sure. (laughs) I I think kind of taking it back to the prep. Yeah, let's let's dive into the prep. (laughs) And um, so when I got down to the end of that prep, I I started feeling... uh, Well, that's when my hormones started getting jacked up, right? And I started waking up really early and things like that. And we started incorporating the the refeeds. And still to this day, I'm, what, what, five weeks out into the reverse diet now. This is going to be week six, I think. And after being here, I feel like I'm starting to reset and kind of get that circadian rhythm back. Um, Whereas before, you know, by the end of it, my hormones were jacked. Um... But I felt I felt good. Like I wasn't I I didn't feel crazy bad. Um, but that last week took its toll on me. And I remember I told you Danny had posted something about me, you, and and someone else, and did a photo, uh, photo of us on Instagram. And then I I, <laughs> I like cried about it because I was like just in this deranged state because it was the prep, like going through everything, the coronavirus, like everything happening all at once. And I was like. Man, I was I felt so um, blessed that he would post something like that, 
um, because I know how how hard like it is to go through this like this contest prep. Um, so it felt good, like when, you know, and I just like teared up about it. It was like crazy. It's funny because I anytime I do a competition prep, I don't do it necessarily to compete. I don't do it necessarily to even really get lean. That's all kind of a byproduct of the prep. I go through a competition prep when I need a period of just extreme discipline, extreme tension, and extreme, just extreme. Like I want to be able to sacrifice. I want to be able to go without. I want to be able to be in a deficit. I want to be able to experience these hard things, these these moments of mental fortitude because the growth, both physically, mentally, and emotionally, that you get from that, I, I have yet to find something that can compare to a prep. There are things that would compare to a prep, but for me personally, like the prep is the perfect, you know, iteration of how to have this self-imposed hardship. I mean, we live in a time where people are allowed to just be soft. I mean, we have things at our fingertips. We have a surplus of food. We have a surplus of safety and security. You have to self-impose these hardships to grow and a prep embodies that to the T. And I get it, man. Like, at the end of the prep, the last month is usually my where it, it gets tough for me. And I'll go on a run every day. I'll meditate. And I'll be very emotional. There'll be periods of time where, like, I'll cry. But I have this newfound sense of self that I would not have been able to have achieved had I not had that period of just incredible hardship. Yeah. I... I agree with that. I am a very disciplined individual in general. Um, I always have been, uh, even before I did this prep. And this is the first prep I've ever done. Uh, but going through this prep, it taught, uh, taught me a lot about myself and how disciplined I was, um, super strict. Um, it teaches you patience, for sure, because there's times where you're going through this prep and you're like, you know, why am I doing this? And But ultimately like you're playing the long game you're you have a goal end goal in sight and for me it's i'm the i'm the type of individual like when i set a goal like i'm gonna attain that goal no matter what you know i'm gonna be extremely disciplined and then i'm going to chop down like i just view it as like this is building character for me i'm and i'm becoming a new person you know as we go through this prep that's kind of how i i viewed the entire prep and um it's this prep has, like, I was always in good shape. I was always, you know, I've been working out for, like, 16, 15, 16 years. Um, but this prep has completely recompositioned my body. Like, I look, um, and you'll throw photos up, but, like, I look completely different now. Um, and I feel amazing. I feel like a new person. But I still have all the same foundational, like, pieces of who I am from before I've just built on top of those now through this prep yeah and the thing about a prep man is it it transcends the sport of bodybuilding itself like you look at the main you know value traits that you can extract from a prep you know discipline consistency patience you know hardship growth like all these things you, you see firsthand how they positively benefit the end result, the, comp the composition of your body by the end of it all. And you're like, huh, well, if it works so well with this sport, let's apply it in this area of my life. And boom, same thing happens. And like that's why I love bodybuilding because it's not about putting lean muscle on your frame. It's about learning these core values, putting them into practice, and then having them transcend that practice and becoming and bleeding into every aspect of your life. Yeah, I, I think it's the process, right? It's the process of the whole prep and changing your mindset around who you are and, and becoming a, a new person or not necessarily a new person, but just building on top of the foundational pieces that you've built uh, about who you are. And that process teaches you so much about yourself. And I'm so happy I went through this prep. I would have... You know, I, I'm 30 now, and I've always 
like the last like 10 years I've kind of been in this limbo stage I was always an athlete but then I've always been looking into like what did I want to do next and I think like I found my niche in ketogenic bodybuilding uh, you know I want to I want to get into modeling um, that is like kind of what I've always wanted to do and this prep has made me aware of how um, how accessible things actually can be. I've always been a disciplined person, but this just made me more heightened, like gave me more heightened awareness of like the fact of what is possible, like what the human body or the human animal can actually achieve when you actually step outside your comfort zone, do things that are hard, and you know, have some consistency, have some discipline, have some patience and play that long game. You know, like I look now at the next three to five to 10 years and I'm like, the longer I get fat adapted, you know, I've been fat adapted for six years, but the longer I get fat adapted, the more I can build and maintain lean muscle mass and live this lifestyle, the possibilities are endless. Um, and I feel amazing. Like so, I really like. Yeah, I may be touted like banging on this drum of ketogenic dieting, and you know, I'm not against carbohydrate or against any other style of dieting. I'm just this is what works for me, and I have now seen going through this prep. I have now seen the benefits of what the human animal is capable of. Yeah, it's it's funny you say these things because this is your first legitimate prep. Like you've had cuts before, but this yeah. is your first like one word you've gone to this extreme yes and i look back on my first prep and that was before i was keto that i broke every rule in the book i (laughs) bulked up you know an unhealthy bulk to 230 pounds i cut down to 150 in a matter of three months like i did everything wrong (laughs) that's insane but what i realized and, and took away from that whole process is that what what the cape what the human body is truly capable of in times of you know, discipline, hardship, consistency, patience. You, you put all these things together, and then you see something amazing come from the fruits of your labor. And that's exciting. Like, that that's when I was, you know, I've got friends uh, that knew me before my first competition that I stay in touch with to this day. And I literally, after my first show, that week after my first show, I called them all up, and I told them, I'm like, look, the Robert Sykes that you've known is dead. This is a new person, and that sounds morbid and whatnot. But I, 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 that's the only way I could describe it. I was reborn. You know, I was the same person, but with a totally different outlook on life, my place in it, what's possible. Like I was totally reshaped. I don't think that sounds morbid at all. I, I think, if you have a negative mindset, it sounds morbid. But if you have a growth mindset, if you have a different mindset, it sounds like. You know, if you're not adapting or changing over time as a as a being, as a human, then you're dying because you need to grow and adapt and redefine yourself as you're as you're aging, as you're getting older, as you're becoming a new person. There's nothing wrong with becoming a new person or or you know, feeling like you know, that person that you were before is no longer and now you're a new person like That's just part of the process, and I think if you have a healthy mindset around it, you don't view it as morbid. You view it as like I'm growing, you know, as a human, as a as a being. I'm I'm growing as a person, and I think over the last, you know, I'm 30 now. Like I think over the last like 10 years, how different I am, and then just over this last seven months of completely redefining myself through a ketogenic prep has even like it's like it's made me more. Uh, down that path and like it has really changed my mindset around around what is possible yeah see that's that's the other reason I do a prep like I feel like I grow more in a six month prep than I do in three years without the prep like you're just forced to develop in ways you never even anticipate and again it doesn't have to be ta- it doesn't have to take the, the form of a prep but just having a very long period, I, I do think the length of time matters. I feel like you have to illustrate just utmost discipline and consistency for an extended period of time and then see the fruits of your labor come to fruition. And then in doing that, you recognize what's possible. And there's there's 
not a whole lot of things where that really applies these days. I mean, I don't know. Like, you really have to self-impose these hardships. That's why I love mindset. Like, you and I are both big into stoicism. And I love applying stoic thinking to the ups and downs that come with the prep because it's like, look, this is my reality. This is what is happening. Let me make a reasonable decision based off of my reality. There's no emotion in it. There's no, you know, it's just, it's just, this is what is. What can I do with it? And I feel like when you have that clarity towards anything in life, you're able to just see so many more strides in progress because you you take away the negative emotion, you take away the positive emotion, you just act upon what is reality, and that is key. Yeah, and, that, and that's big. Um, you know, stoicism has been a staple the la- last three years or so, um, and we were talking about this. Danny kind of got me into stoicism. You got him into stoicism, so as a byproduct, I said, I guess you got me into stoicism. Um, and it's changed who I am as a person because... You know, it's your reason, choice, to, uh, how you react to every situation that's going on. And for me, a stoic approach to everything has really defined who I am now. Um, you know, not having a emotional reaction to most things where most people would um, has really changed my mindset around things, which has been is helped in a lot of ways. Um, so that's been big. Let's talk about the because you and I are both entrepreneurs you're you and I are both very much so like driven type a personalities coming down here to the farm you know we've got the river in the background we got the birds chirping we're sipping on coffee in a rocking chair on a porch I mean this is like (laughs) straight up relaxation and we were talking yesterday about how it's hard for people like you and I in the fray to say, hey, let's go to the farm and relax. But then when you're here, it's like, wow, I need to make this a, this this needs to be a scheduled thing in my life because I leave here with more creativity and just more clarity. And I feel like a lot of people have a problem with, you know, it's it's like lifting. Like we can use lifting as an analogy. You know, having a scheduled deload week is going to make you a better, stronger you're going to recover faster. Like, you're going to benefit from having a scheduled deload week every six to eight weeks or whatever. You know, the same is true with the mind, having a scheduled disconnect. Now, I do not think this is the same thing as, like, a work-life balance. I've always kind of touted that balance is bullshit, and I've said that because so in so many, you know, circles, people have this hobby that is very unrelated to what they're normally doing. And it doesn't really contribute to the overall whole. It's just totally a, a 180 shift. And I feel like that distracts from the impact you can make. Whereas a disconnect or something like this is not necessarily a 180 shift away from what you're normally doing. It, it only contributes to what you're normally doing. But you have to have a deload in your mind. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth when you started talking about the training <clears throat> aspect because you intuitively would have a deload training week when it comes to performance um, but why wouldn't you want to deload your life a little bit and then in that sense coming out to the farm um, and decompressing and being able to shift the mind from go 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 gas pedal gas pedal gas pedal to let's pump the brakes let's take a let's let's reset I think ultimately even if it's for a couple days when you get back into it then you can gas pedal harder um, so that, you know, that deload of your life, um, and you don't necessarily need to do this every four weeks or six weeks, but I think you need that in times. Um, and then for me coming out right after this prep and doing this now, uh, it's been perfect. It's been like a, kind of like a lifesaver, like, a, you know, I, cause for a while, the last like four or five weeks, I've been just pushing your body to the limits. Like you're waking up early you're working, 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 trying to get things done. You're trying to write, you're trying to do things. And, you know, sometimes you hit these mental blocks, but coming out here and being forced because there's no internet out here. Um, you're forced to put your phone away. You're so in times where you would reach for that phone and scroll through Instagram and see what's going on in the world and get your news. 
you're not doing that now. You're like having conversation. You're having real conversation with someone about anything. And then you're just listening to the birds chirping and like it's a perfect decompression decompression and and like reset of the body and the mind. Yeah, it's funny because I, I don't even feel like we recognize how much we fill our time, our void with social media, with technology. There's been a couple times here that I've grabbed my phone to look at it out of habit only to find that there's no internet connection. Yep. And it's like, why did I even grab my phone in the first place? Done that a handful of times. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, this whole this whole time that you've been here, we, we got here on Friday midday. It's now Sunday morning. We, we could have had a podcast this entire time because this entire time we've talked about compelling information, beliefs, values. It, it all would have been a great podcast. Yeah, for sure. But it was all a real conversation. You know, it was all enjoyable. It was all something that I've benefited from, you've benefited from, we've grown from. And I feel like you lose so much of that when you're just stuck in these this multimedia world and getting bite-sized piece of information in which you can't truly communicate. Like a Twitter post or an Instagram, you know, caption. That does not convey the underlying message near as well as a face-to-face conversation. That doesn't illustrate what that person is and who they are near as well as a face-to-face interaction. And I feel, or I hope at least, that things always make a full circle. They always come back to baseline. And I, I hope that people start doing that as well, especially amidst the virus. You know, people have had to self-distance for so long now that they're craving real human face-to-face interaction. Yeah. So I hope that 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 just continues to get better and people can do things like this. They don't have to be at a farm in the middle of nowhere, but just simply, you know, valuing a handshake, valuing looking someone in the eye and communicating with them. I don't know. I feel like we're all we all benefit from that. Yeah, and it it could be as simple as going on a walk and, you know, and talking with someone and just having that real connection. It yeah. doesn't have to be coming out to a farm like this, but it sure does help. It sure does help. <laughs> yeah, we uh we saw some pigs. We saw some deer. We saw quite a few deer. Yeah, a lot um, of deer. We caught a fish. You didn't pull your weight much fishing, bro. I never pull my weight in fishing. <laughs> I told you I think I am bad luck. I don't think I've ever caught a fish. I, I've gone fishing a lot. I don't think I've ever caught a fish. Well, that one that we caught put up a good fight. but It was a good one, man. It was not worth Solid eating. Catch. We threw him back. Um, well, let's talk about what you've got coming up. What's, what's in the in the works for you? You've got a pretty big move in the pipeline. So, you know, I've been <clears throat> kind of developing a, uh, I, I, one, I want to get into modeling, but two, um, oh, big move, big move. Yeah, where'd you think I was going with that? <laughs> I thought you were going somewhere else. Um, for me, next steps is uh, my girlfriend and I are actually planning a move to Hawaii. I think we're about 40 days out of, as of today. Um, we plan on moving to Oahu. Um, we're going to live in town, which is Honolulu. Um, and we're super excited about it, man. I, I like, I can't tell you how excited I am. We're, we're in New Jersey right now. We wanted to come back to New Jersey. Prior to that, I was in Tampa for 10 years. Um, and prior to that, I was in Rhode Island. Um, and I cannot wait for Hawaii. I am so excited because it, the lifestyle I live is very simple. Um, you know, I, I like to be on the move. I like to hike. I like to be adventurous and all those things. And Hawaii offers that lifestyle for me. And I'm just super pumped. And when we get there, I told you, I, I can't wait to have you guys out. And we're going to go on a hunt probably on a different island. It's called Molokai. Um, but I'm super pumped about it. I think, you know, I've, he- I've heard you talk about this move this whole weekend. You've been talking about You've been showing me pictures for a while last time you were there. And... It's just obvious that you're incredibly excited about it. And that is inspiring to see. I think it's important for people to be excited about something. You know, people always say that they just want to live a happy life. They want to be happy. That's a very hard thing to define. I feel like happiness is excitement. Like, when was the last time you were excited about something and not happy? You know? Like, you have to have excitement in life. So, knowing that you're just ramped up and ready for this move to Hawaii. You have something to look forward to. You have suspense. You have, you know, just this 
this undying desire to do something and create something with yourself. I feel like that's something that everybody should pursue, whether they move to Hawaii or not, I don't know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and happiness is different for everyone, right? Yeah. You know, happiness could be living on a farm. Happiness could be living in New York City. You know, it's different for everyone. But for me, it's creating the lifestyle I want that I see and that I envision for not only myself, but for my family. Um, you know, I see, when I look 10, 15, 20 years down the road, I see me waking up in the morning, making keto pancakes for my kids and my wife, going on a hike. Um, I, I wanna start my morning with a hike every morning, see the sunrise coming up over the island. Like, that's what I envision, and that's what I've been trying to create for my family. Um, for the last, you know, three to five years or so, I've been trying to get there, and it's finally like culminating into this. You know, we're moving to Hawaii. Like I, I am so excited for it because it is f- pushing me out of my comfort zone, but it's pushing me toward the lifestyle I want to live. And I feel like a lot of people, they don't go after what they want a lot of times because they're scared. They're scared of failure. But you know, what's on the other side of failure if you don't fail is could be great it could be amazing and it's exactly what you want but you don't do it because you're scared yeah it's 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 interesting because i was talking about this the other day with crystal so many people they they have things that are good going <clears throat> and it seems like they, they believe that after so many weeks of it being good that something's bound to happen that's gonna be bad or they'll do something that's outside their comfort zone and they'll automatically start backpedaling because it's outside their comfort zone. And, you know, you hear the phrase, growth lies outside your comfort zone. And it becomes cliche because you hear it so often. But it could not be more true. I mean, you look at what you've experienced in this prep. That whole thing was outside your comfort zone. Yeah, but sure. you've grown more as a person because of it. This move to Hawaii, I mean, you have no family in Hawaii. You've got, like, there's a lot of obstacles you got to jump through. But you're going to grow so much as a person in doing it. I look at what I'm doing now with Crystal and the crew with Keto Brick, and there's some major decisions that we're making right now that I hope to share with you all very soon that are way outside of my comfort zone. But if everything goes through, it will redefine the future. And having those redefining moments, I mean, that is the story of your life, chapter by chapter that you're living. You get to write your own book. Are you writing a book that if you were reading it, you would get bored with it and it would put you to sleep and you'd want to put it down? Or are you writing a book that is literally keeping you on the edge of your seat and you are flipping page to page just in excitement? Like, ask yourself that. Let that be your self-check. Like, what kind of book are you writing? It just fired me up. Yeah. <laughs> it just brings me back to what I said before. You know, if you're not adapting and changing, you're, you're kind of, you're dying, you know, adapt or die. And, you know, just being able to push yourself in in regards to a- anything you do in life whether it's business or or lifestyle choices or changing or doing what you want to do and not what is societal norm you know like just go after what you want go after what you love uh, you know and yeah. our podcasts always seem to go into the mindset shift like we it's not a bad like, thing we should talk about keto and then it always goes mindset but i think it's because you and i just have this, this very similar view on life and we're just not willing to accept normal we're not willing to accept the average we we want to push ourselves to the brink and we want to show people that you can you can also do this but we also do it like in trying to bring it back whole, full circle here is like you can do this living a ketogenic lifestyle as well. Yeah, it's it's funny because I don't I don't think my way is better than every other way. I don't think that, you know, I don't ever want to be painted to the picture of being super dogmatic about strict keto. Like that's not the message I've ever tried to preach. Mm-hmm. What I try to preach is happiness and fulfillment lies outside the comfort zone and it is obtained by exercising extreme discipline and consistency and patience and playing the long game I mean when have you ever found anything in life that was good 
that came from something easy, something simple, something where you didn't have to exercise discipline. It doesn't exist. It doesn't. And it only makes sense to me in my mind that the same holds true to my nutrition, to my business, to my relationships. Like, I, I smile in the face of knowing that there's something hard. Like, I'm drawn to strict keto because it does require a little bit of discipline. I look at people that are just constantly bouncing from one thing to the next thing to the next thing as not having that discipline. And I totally get the desire to self-experiment and play around and see what works well with you. I've done that. You know, I get it. But whatever it is in life, when you know that when it's right, know that it's right and experiment within that realm, but stay within that realm and just keep growing and exercising that discipline. Yeah. And, and that holds true in nutrition, that holds true in your career, that holds true in, like I said, your relationships, everything. And that's always been the message I've tried to preach. I it's couldn't not, agree more. Yeah. We're preaching the same language, man. Always. Always. <laughs> so, I don't know how long we've been re- recording, but there's a wasp nest right above us, and as it gets warmer, Speaking they become wasp nest. more active. First day I was here, I got stung. Yeah, first day before we went Jinx. on a run, the savage run. The savage run. You got stung by red wasp. Yeah. Does it swell up at all or no? Nah. No? Luckily, I guess I'm not allergic to wasps. I, I didn't, it didn't swell up, but it hurt. Yeah, the red wasp will get you, man. <laughs> well, Trevor, I think we should probably more or less call it a, call it a podcast. Sounds good to me, man. We're gonna, you're going to come to the compound after this, and yeah. then we're going to record more. We're going to work out more. We'll get some good footage, some yeah, video, really some excited. audio. I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited about getting my hands dirty and making some keto bricks. Making some keto bricks. Oh, yeah. one more shameless plug. And I won't even say it. You've already said it. But one thing that you've done the entire prep, the in- entirety of your prep, both in the prep itself and the reverse diet, that achieved, that helped achieve and worked alongside you achieving the leanest physique you've ever obtained, included eating a keto brick every day. This is true. I've had a half or a full keto brick every single day for the last eight months. Yeah. And that's something to be said because I don't eat all of the um, the nonsense keto processed keto foods out there and for me finding food that like just works really well with you know that's bioavailable that's micronutrient dense and that helps me achieve and attain my goals um, in a body composition wise um, the keto brick is is perfect it's the ultimate ketogenic performance bar and that's why I've had a half or a full brick every single day because it's literally perfect, man. You've you've got a good product, and the best part of it is, and when when you sit down with you and you know people who don't know you, you know they, I I don't I want don't want anything to get misconstrued because you did not develop this product as a product for the market. You developed this product because it fit your need of bodybuilding, and I cannot like tell you that going through this prep, a bodybuilding prep, and then utilizing that product and seeing why you develop that product, it's like, oh, okay, now I get it. And you never developed it as a way to sell. Like, you developed it because it literally fit your lifestyle. And that, to me, is how companies and products should be developed. It shouldn't be developed as a tool to just, like, a process thing that just, like, kind of helps you live a lifestyle like or like just kind of out there for you to curb your sweet treat to curb your sweet uh tooth um it should be out there to optimize your life yeah and see i I don't ever want to sound biased talking about it because i am the creator of the company (laughs) and i don't want to bring people on with them thinking they have to talk about it not at all to promote the product but i didn't make it like you said to sell as a product I made it during my 2017 competition prep as a way of, you know, implementing during my refeeds to fill out. I mean, the other day, yesterday, you ate a half a keto brick with your ribeye, and then the sodium, you had not had that much sodium that day, and you could instantly tell after the keto brick, your vascularity filled out. Yeah, it was crazy. And started popping. And that's what I was eating backstage prior to stepping on stage. Yeah. You know? And like, like I said, I didn't make it as a product. I've kept it in-house, so I haven't had to outsource it. I haven't had to go through a co-packer so that I can oversee personally the quality of every ingredient, every brick, every production run, every everything, because I believe in it, yep. and I want other people to benefit from it. 
but there's no filler crap. There's no there's no compromises, and it means the world to me to see you and Brandon and others that I've worked with use it during their prep and it do exactly what it was intended to do. Yeah. And that's I can hang my hat on that. Yeah. That's what I'm proud of. As you should. Yeah. It's it's an amazing product. Appreciate it, man. <laughs> Well, these wasps and bees are definitely getting more active. <laughs> They're coming. <laughs> They're coming. They're coming for us. <laughs> so we are going to call it a podcast. Where can people go to find out more about you? Uh, you can just go on Instagram. I am space T white. Um, that's my Instagram handle. You can find me there. Um, that's pretty much it. Awesome. I will link out to that. Trevor, always a pleasure, man. All right, brother. Have a good one. And uh, I, I guess this is the nice thing about in-person podcasts is I'll still see you when this is done recording. We'll still so. hang out. We'll still hang out. <laughs> Y'all have a good one.